Professor Rachel. He has been the president of uh, the Leibniz Association from 2005 to 2010, and he has always been a strong promoter, at least in the last years, uh, for gender equality, having more women in science, using the talent that we have, all the issues, and it's I must say it's good to have a man talking about that and we were very happy that we could get him. At the moment he is um, at working at the National Academy of Science and Engineering and is the representative of European Affairs there and he's also professor in uh, immunochemistry at the University of Lübeck and used to be the executive director of this center. Professor Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor to talk here. And I'll give you more a personal view than a structured presentation. As we have heard, two of these presentations where programs are advanced in a way which is really impressive as we compare this five years ago. Um, I will start my talk by asking you to look at this picture. When you came today to this building to this conference, you certainly have seen pictures like that. And they are deeply seated in our minds that namely a mother, a woman has a child and that a man is working. I'm showing you this because this is a stereotype which is seated deeply and at the end of my talk I will tell you this is one of the cultural things we have to get rid of although it's very nice to have somebody working for a family, of course, also it's very nice to have a mother caring for the children. We don't doubt that, but these stereotypes, they disturb our daily life. So, is it a stereotype which is wrong, or is it perhaps that women and men are different, and therefore they assume different, naturally different roles? different gender roles, or is it that men and women are not so different, but nevertheless, because of other reasons, assume different stereotypic uh, gender roles? This is what I tried to talk to, uh, about today. Men and women, women and men, are very different, but they are very similar. And you can see that from a study of the Sc Scottish Mental Survey, and I'm sure most of you know about that, it's a very schematic representation where you can see that women and men are identical when it comes to the average intelligence uh, qu quotient, the IQ. We have exactly, on an average, the same IQ. However, there is a difference. And that difference is that men are more dispersed. They are much more stupid young guys or older men but there are also more intelligent men. Why this is so is, a, is, is an open question. I, I think it's environment, education, has nothing to do with genetic uh, basis. But this is the fact. So there are more intelligent men, which means there is a positive aspect to it, but there's also a negative aspect because intelligence can, both, can uh, somebody can make use of his intelligence in, in two ways. And I illustrate this by this figure. These are the prisoners in German prisons. You see, as compared to Nobel Prize winners. You see a total of 806 Nobel Prize winners have been uh, 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 counted. Of these, 765 are men and 41 are women, 5.4%. And of these 41, we have 24 for peace and literature. Men in prisons, we have 70,000 men in prison, only 3,800 women, by chance 5.3%, so it's identical here, this number. And of course, so the majority of, of the negative intelligence is men. So the positive intelligence of men and the negative intelligence of men versus a relatively ho homogeneous distribution makes us different. And of course, we would agree, if you look at our children or grandchildren, young girls and young boys are different. So if I look at two, my two uh, uh, little girls, the, the, the daughters of my daughter, my grandchildren, they read all the time, 
And if I look at my uh, young, uh, the son of my son who lives in Brussels, there's a compassion for computer games. And, and there's statistics that this, there's a difference between the two in computer games by a factor of 10. Girls have a certain weakness for glamour, whereas boys, all statistically significant, uh, have affection for sport, cars, motorcycles, etc. Of course, there's a, a muscular difference. And girls have a love for, for animals and horses. If somebody can tell me why this is so, I'll invite you for dinner. Because I've, I've, I've studied a lot about that, I don't find out, but it is a fact. And, and in the boy group, there is, there is a, a danger of violation, both as actors and as victims, 50% more than girls. So the personalities are different, and of course, this de the development of personality is influenced by genes, not as much as we think. I've, I've worked on that, not in the general issue, but uh, diseases, uh, with a few exceptions, are very rarely really determined by genes. So it's a wrong conception to say this is all determined by genes. Of course, by hormones, much more so by education. And finally, I think the most important factor is the environment, and, um, which means education. So there are differences. And in, in women and men, when they're grown up, there are also differences um, as, as a very general thing, of course, as you may uh, realize. Women are better in consideration of social environment, whereas men love adventure. It's a certain attack mentality. And the care for common wealth is much more expressed in the female world than in the men world, where competition, competition oriented and, and, and assertiveness is more prevailing. And, and women, as, as a whole, have less interest in boards or panels, whereas we, striving to be in a board and, and to be recognized as, as, as important with this ambition. This difference, as an average, certainly exists, but then from this to conclude that this means a wife has to be, a, a woman has to be a housewife and a mother and a man has to has the right to follow his career and top position. I think this is the problem where we are. Because I think we would all agree this does not automatically follow. These are different qualities, but why should not these qualities lead to a career in top position and used in a top position, and why don't these qualities perhaps more uh, can also be used uh, at home? The German situation, why this is so, uh, uh, and that is very German, I excuse uh, 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 that I'm uh, briefly mentioning that. I think in Germany we have that special problem, the deviation in the philosophy, in the literature, also in politics, from a woman to the mother, the concentration on the mother picture. So marriage and family, the mother represents the center, not the woman, the mother represents the center uh, in, in overall the focus on mother instead of a woman and rather polarization or balance between male and, and, and female sex. This is a, a very German problem, which I won't go into in more detail now, which in the northern countries and also the Netherlands is not as expressed as in Germany. There was a time in Germany also, or especially in Germany, when this stereotype role between women and men was not at all existent because after the war, Many men were still uh, uh, somewhere in prison, and uh, the women in Germany were almost alone. And the female post-war heroes, I've called them, because at that time, women were in a position to play both roles, both, both stereotypes. They were mothers at the same time as workers. They were completely independent. And if Germany has become what it has become after the war, it's because of these women. They have created the basis for today's society. So we in Germany know exactly that the stereotypes are wrong. We know exactly that women alone can build up a country. But still, we have that problem here. We have that problem more than many other countries. Now, after, the, uh, uh, after 1968, this revolutionary year, and of course, 
with the introduction of the birth, uh, birth control pill, there has been a different development. A different development of a young female generation, which automatically, without, in a non-revolutionary way, I say here, feel that they are entitled to liberté, égalité, fraternité, which means freedom, gender equality, and a certain solidarity among the two sexes. This is this generation, and we all know them, and many of them uh, sitting here. It's your young generation. This young generation of female uh, uh, gender uh, is not, a, in my uh, opinion, is not a successor generation of the feminist movement. The feminist movement was important to get a start, but now this is very different. They have no uh, uh, bad feeling against men, not at all. They don't fight men, they consider them as partner, as the men are expected to consider them as partners. They have a completely self-confident gender identity. They um, follow up their uh, own life design, and they have a deep and elemental feeling of equal rights. This is very good, but the last point is also very dangerous, as I will come back to. And they feel that this is, they are on the right way, because as was mentioned before, if you look at different uh, disciplines, the number of young female students is increasing. Almost everywhere, in all, in medicine, in uh, dental medicine particularly, etc. So this young generation of fem female uh, young ladies feels that they are on the march forward. But this picture is not shown to these young women. And we know this picture, I'm sure you all know that. And that is the young students here. Here, this is where the young uh, girls are, are taking off, and, and they're even more now in, in certain uh, disciplines. And after examination, the gender equality is absolutely fulfilled. But then comes the first step, this is dissertation, to get a doctorate or the habilitation for German universities. And you see how this scissor really opens in a dramatic way. And uh, the top position at the universities are, of course, to 80, 50, 85 to 80% occupied by men and by, by women. This is the situation. Uh, where, where uh, Germany is in, and of course other countries too, but I'm, I, I focus, I'm focusing on Germany. And we have the situation, and uh, this is probably all well known to you, the better endowed and the more influential a position, the smaller the percentage of female participation, although, as we have seen, the potential of the rising generation is enormous. Secondly, the share of women in scientific top position is very low, about 14 to 60 percent at German universities, and the increase at the present time is 1 percent per year. In other words, if we would aim at 50 percent, we have to wait almost 40 years. And, the scandal, and this scandalous situation in, in uh, Germany is only topped by Belgium and Malta. Now, and this is more important for me, Young women very often do not wish to, at least they don't, realize the problems of gender inequality and injustice. And what you are doing, I think, one of the aspects, not only fighting for women, but also making it clear to them they are facing these problems and they have to adjust to them. So young women have to be aware of the fact that their professional career plan in life will be met with serious problems, not automatically, as they think, after having their maturation. There are serious problems, and this must be uh, uh, realized and analyzed to order to develop strategies to overcome these obstacles. So it's really for this young generation of young female, brilliant female young uh, uh, students where, where I feel, where my engagement is uh, in, in all that. Now, it's, let's have a closer look to that. That is a typical man here, by the way, and having the foresight uh, for the future. Why do the, f the careers of female scientists really crack? 
Of course, man always says, very simple, is children and family. It's true. But if you solve the problem of children and family, and I give you some examples how we can do that, for many of my colleagues, the, the problem is solved. But this is not so. In science, there is another thing, the resources of science, so how is scientists work and what is expected from a scientist. This is very important in science, maybe different in, in other, other uh, disciplines. But I think the most important is the rope parties of man. In German, this is Seilschaften, rope parties of man. The networks and the circles of man who stay intact unconsciously. I don't think that the men want to keep their network closed unconsciously. They are afraid that others enter these networks, and if women come to enter them, there's a, a, a big force to refuse that. I think this is the most important problem. And at the end of my talk, I only concentrate on, on that aspect. Uh, I'll briefly go through the, so three, these three points and, uh, and, and give you one example uh, as dilemma one of young women. Why is children and family a problem for them? This is a survey published in Brigitte, which was organized by Jutta Almendinger in Berlin. And there were many, many statistics in that uh, study. I give you only one figure. Women were asked, and men, men blue, women red, were asked, would you give up uh, your job in order to uh, raise children? And you can see that the men stay by about 6%, 6 to 7%. Independent, whether they had small kids or they had large, uh, uh, elder kids or they had no children, and as a total. Women are very different, very different, significantly, highly significantly different so 38% of the women were ready to give up their job in order to raise children. And, uh, with, and you can see by yourself, so a total of 29% uh, uh, of the young women were, were ready to give up their job. This is a dilemma for young women because it means, in a, in, in a nutshell, that the family that is a unit of man and woman in generally married, nowadays we must be careful, uh, a, a unit of men and women with children is one of is is very important for young uh, women to have. is is part of the essence of happiness in their life, and maybe stronger or at least at least equally strong as independence, financial income, self fulfillment in a profession, or power, honor, respect in a career. Dilemma number one. Dilemma number two, it says in English, I have no idea how I can combine family and career, for those who do not speak German. The second is resources in science. So I'm a chemist and I know that very well. Um, there are unrealistic expectations towards female scientists in our scientific community, in the day-to-day -day life. Look at, uh, at the example of competence and performance versus recognition by male colleagues, or let's say in the field of medicine by a, by a patient. If a young, intelligent, beautiful young lady comes in in a white coat, and there's a patient, the patient may ask, and where's the doctor? Because he thinks she's the nurse. So this respect and the expectation that a young female person is intelligent, is capable of doing that, is not seated in our society. The physical presence and flexi flexibility, of course we expect it, and the pressure in science is increasing. Every year we expect it to be in the laboratory, not only during the week, also during the week and day and night. And physics, physics where you have, let's say you work in CERN, in Geneva, or in the DAISY, uh, the neutros, uh, neutron accelerator in Hamburg, you have to be there all the time, or you have to be, be free to be there all the time. If you have measuring time between uh, midnight, uh, 12 and 4, you have to be there. And, and uh, the use of machines in the chemistry is the same. So 
you have to be absolutely flexible in, in, in your presence, which is very difficult to combine that with uh, regular childcare, unless you have a husband or somebody who helps you. Of, of course, you will not find somebody to pay to take care of your child between midnight and four o'clock in the after, uh, at night when you have measuring time. And career and leadership versus multi-optionality. That is something I think I will, I will come back to as one of my, my major points. We should not expect what I want to say here, that every woman, every young woman, woman wants to have a top position because it's, it's a very different situation if you want to combine the two. The third point is power and male-dominated networks, as I said, and I think this is the most important of, of them all. I'll give you a very simple ex explanation and example of what I mean by that. This is a Dutch study, and it deals with the university nomination committees for 900 professors in the Netherlands between 1999 and 2005. Um, the first very big surprise is that 64% of these professors were not appointed by an open procedure. I would have sweared it would be 90%. That's not true. In other words, there were calls and uh, it, within the faculties it was already arranged. So only we're talking about only 36% 36, uh, 36 after an open advertisement. The second... A professor is uh, appointed by a nomination uh, committee. And the simple finding is, if the nomination committee had no women, no professors, women, then 7% of the nominees were female. 7%. If there was only one female member, one female professor in the nomination committee, already 14%. If there were two or more women, 22%, almost a linear, linear, uh, um, uh, um, not a curve, uh, a straight line. So this is very remarkable. And what does it show? That men think about men when it comes to this top position. And there must be somebody telling them, hey, wait a minute, there is another 50% in our population which has to be considered. And this is only done by women. So. This is the example how the university works, and if you look very hard, you will not find a single woman. This is Raphael who pointed, uh, who, it's not a woman, this is Raphael who, who painted it. So as a summary, I, I would like to say in the hierarchy of problems we are facing today, number one is the power of men and rope parties of men. And this is a cultural problem which can only be resolved politically, as we have discussed before. Perhaps by money, but politically, I would say politically, and this is quota and laws. This, for me, is the most important problem, and the rest of my time I was spending with this. The science imminent habits, as we have discussed, is a structural problem. There may be solutions, may be very difficult in physics, but there may be, and medicine, but there may be solution in chemistry, in pharmacy, in other scientific um, uh, disciplines by just getting into the organization. Dual career, I've, I've put as one example, but there are many uh, better examples. And the third is the family in adequate working conditions. Of course, this is a practical problem which must be solved, of course. But I think this is just a financial problem. If you give a university or an institute enough money with uh, the dedication, build a kindergarten or a kita or things like that, have somebody who is helping a mother who needs to give a talk at a conference here and the child f falls sick and, and somebody to take care for this time, etc. It's a financial problem. There are enough solutions for that um, uh, uh, ready. But this here we don't have a solution. And we can talk and organize as much as we want. If we don't solve this problem here, we will never solve the mindset set, the change of the mindset we need. What we need 
is a quota. So I'm of the opinion, since many years, and I've given many talks of, on that, and uh, I was shedded with eggs and tomatoes, etc. We need a quota. If somebody has a better idea how this cultural mindset can be changed, okay, we can discuss that. I've not found any. So the quota, of course, is, is a terrible term. Nobody likes quota. So in Germany, we are very good in discussion. So a lot has been discussed, but the numbers are bad. We have discussed so much quantitative agreement. Okay, let's call it a quantitative agreement. No problem. Or the Wissenschaftsrat here has, has, has established a model uh, where, where the cascade is in, in, in implied. Fine. But finally, after all, it's a quota. And the introduction of quota is also terrible. How can we do that? By self voluntary commitment, that would be nice, like Norway has started. But finally, Norway has legal regulation introduced because also the Norwegian saw this is voluntary commitment, does really not help. So I think there's only one way, and that is that we have to have a uh, a legal uh, regulation of quota. A second point is everybody says, ah, oh, quota, my gosh, never in the world. But in Germany, we live with quota all the time without realizing it. Um, for those who are in the university field, we have a wonderful instrument by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinde. This is called Sonderforschungsbereich. Special, uh, these are type of clusters where the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft gives much money for a cluster to be uh, working. Now, in this cluster is a quota. It says that two-thirds of the projects have to be a university project. Let's say the University of Stuttgart makes such a cluster. Two-thirds of the project, and there are about 20 projects, must come from the university. Only one-third can come from non-university institutions like Max Planck, or Helmholtz, Leibniz, and Fraunhofer. This is a clear quota, and we live with it. It does not mean that one-third, this project from Max Planck, is a bad project, less quality. I tell this already to those who say, I don't want to be a quota woman. They may be the best. I would say this one-third in the quality, they are the best project. So the one-third, the quota women may be the best uh, 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 scientists. has nothing to do with quality. Then, this is very German here, but this is something very funny, and uh, you may not know, even the Germans do not know. We live with a quota in radios with music. In 2004, our parliament has decided that 35% of the total music in a radio has to be German. A German composer, it's fine if you play Bach, Beethoven or Brahms, or a German singer like Udo Lindenberg. That's also fine. 35%. I don't think whether, I don't know whether it's controlled, but it's a law. And we have a quota law for something absolutely stupid. Absolutely stupid. And nobody complains about that. So what I want to say, we live with quota without realizing it or objecting to it. There are many arguments against quota. And they were already discussed. Of course, constitutional aspects. Constitution says we all have the same rights and that you cannot uh, prefer one, one uh, specific gender. I will come back to that. Science criteria, and that is in the science discussion, where we say quota, we don't want that. Uh, our selection criteria for a professor is only quality and originality and, and, and um, best science. There are so many excellent women in the world that I don't see why we have to get off of that criteria, a set of criteria. We'll find them. The only point is we must find them, and we must be forced to, to find them. So this is, I, I don't accept that at all. Quota on uh, an insult for successful women, yes, that is, the case if women do feel like that. But I ask these women who have made their way up to the professor or leader or director or whatever, help your country fellow men, I would have almost said, help your colleagues, female colleagues, 
And by not objecting to that, you had a different time uh, 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 line, you had a different life, help them and do not object against uh, the quota. Nobody, and therefore I'm looking at that excellence, nobody questions your performance uh, as a director if we have a quota for, uh, uh, for women. A serious argument, of course, is if we have a, a quota for support of women, other social groups would also claim the right for a quota. This is true, and we have agreed to that in part. We have parking spaces for disabled people. This is also a quota, if you like, and we all accept that in society. I think there's no problem with any of us that we accept that, such things. So this is, for me, also no argument. And the, the only argument where I feel some affection for is, and that is those young female scientists who do not make it, despite we have a quota, they feel not very well. But they are, at the, at, at the present time, we don't have a, a quota, so basically they should not be against it at the present time. We can see in 10 years that there's a certain amount of young uh, uh, women who have not made it, uh, despite the quota, who may have, uh, um, um, how should I say, um, uh, bad feelings about that. So, the last point, of course, is the proposal, and we have discussed that already, that we introduce a quota, which of course is not a women quota. It's a gender quota or a men and women quota, and you have said already, because in some of the fields we are discussing, the men will have a problem to be at the 40%. Uh, law, jurisdiction is one of these uh, things. And we can start with quota. We, we must not change the world completely, although I think we should change it by a law. But we could start already, and even that is not done, by introducing quotas in, in, very simple, in a very simple way. Uh, so executive supervisory boards, uh, university nomination committees can be done Tomorrow can be done today. Evaluation committees, external peer reviews of publications, very important. Uh, because, yeah. Scientific advisory boards, discussion for and speakers list of symposia as we are uh, here. That can be done immediately and followed by uh, leading positions, of course. That is the aim. My conclusion of all that is working, thinking, praying, talking about that field since many, many years. We have to introduce a quota, which may be temporary, until the moment when gender equality in top positions is achieved. Then we don't need this quota, of course, anymore, because behind the quota and behind the problem is that women need to establish their own networks their own networks as a basis because the power of man is based on networks, not the power of the individual, it's the power of the network. And if the women have their network, then, they're in the, then they are in a very strong position. And of course, at the end, and who would not wish that, that the two net networks would intermingle and one day mix. But we should not start with a mix, in my opinion. We should clearly say, First, women need their own network. How quotas or pressure will change the life is best shown by one of the most esteemed scientific institutions in the world, the Massachusetts Institute of Te Technology, MIT, where in the year 1970, you see the number of women in the faculty, this is the professors, was between zero and four. Title IX meant um, uh, gender equality, and within one, two years, this went up. So it stayed constant because the quota was, uh, or the demand of that title was 20, 20 uh, uh, women, so they reached this level. Then the MIT Women in Science report to the dean was introduced. We asked more, and whoops, it went up again, up to 30%. And this is where it is. Nowadays in the United States, so they started in 1970, 30 years ago. Now, nowadays in the United States, gender equality is not discussed anymore because that mindset, 
the changement has taken place. If American reviewers of uh, uh, applications come to Europe, uh, they, are, they feel this is a disaster here uh, because for them it's already natural. So in, in this sense, here we don't need a quota anymore. We had the quota here and therefore I say temporarily. At the end, I, I would like to end with a certain, I would say, positive um, uh, attitude because we cannot meet every year and say we need a quota and go home and we don't have a quota and be, be depressed. We must see uh, how we can go forward and also look at what perhaps women really want. They want themselves and not from the point of view of an elderly male uh, uh, member of the society. I think a m number of points are worth to consider before we have a model what uh, uh, we, we could propose. So women, the young women of today, they refuse to match traditional roles. This is clear. They want to decide for themselves how to plan and construct their life on the basis of their individual intelligence, talent, energy, and education. However, with the option to combine family and partnership with the profession. This is the essence of what I feel women want, in contrast to men who concentrate only on this. And the way they do this is very different from one individual to the other. There are many more men, because of this ambition thing I started with, who want to go the, to the top and be in, in competition all the time than women who rather look, look for a combination of the two at realizing that this top position makes it very difficult in our society to combine, to combine the two. I think what our society really and politics needs to do is to enable and establish conditions that women have all the options they want. The option to go to the top, the option to have a family, and the option to combine the two. But we have to construct the framework which enables all that. At the present time, we don't have that framework. So I think that um, the duty of our society to do that, the politicians are not on the right track at the present time. I hope that Mrs. Merkel, we have elections last year, uh, next year in, in Germany, I think Mrs. Merkel is considering at least that she'll take in her agenda quota because some of the ministers favor quota, others, others do not. And I think at the end she needs something where the election, uh, where, where she can show a specific way in, in her uh, uh, way to, to go into the elections. And I'm positive at the present time that she may uh, um, uh, select the quota. So, and, so the society has by politics to be gently guided in the right direction, what I call the right di direction. And I think that quotas are the most efficient means to guarantee this right direction at least for a certain time, and as we have seen in the United States, it's 30 years. So to summarize, gender parity and science and female multi-optionality presuppose gender parity as a civil obligation. It must be a constitutional. This is what I said before. Many people say the Constitution says we are all the same, and therefore a, a quota uh, is not possible. But if we take the Constitution seriously, we must do something in order to get this right to women to have the same uh, uh, rights and, and be on the same situation. Gender par uh, parity as a directed priority issue of a scientific in institution. Gender uh, equality is, is, is so important for the reasons we have heard before that the directors of the institutions, the presidents of the universities must take this in their hand. It's not this poor little lady who is uh, made responsible to go into the uh, uh, senates and, so on and, and, and raise her voice and there are 80 female, uh, male 
uh, uh, partners who say, no, we want it differently. The director, the president must do that. Gender parity is different from the subsidy politics for them. Many men misunderstand. So it's not that we are so nice to help women. It's their right, and we have to change this attitude completely. Gender parity as a criterion of quality. This is very pr provocative. We could say an institution, if it's evaluated or a project, we take gender parity as a quality criterion. As a scientist, of course, I cannot follow that. It's only excellence. This is originality and quality. But I also see that would also help very much, as we discussed before in the UA, uh, EU grants programs, if you would take this not as a little side criterion, okay, they have something in, in, in gender uh, uh, um, uh, equality, so this is nice, but we first look at, at excellence. If you would take this on the same level, so as a criterion, which is really important, I think we could change also. And gender models, by this I will end, because this is also something which is very important. So Marie Curie, who discovered radium, and you know, and she died from that, and she isolated radium, had a daughter, Irene Curie, who married to Mr. Joliot, and she got also the Nobel Prize. Actually, Marie Curie got two Nobel Prizes. Uh, nine, uh, nine, that's not correct. 1911 uh, and the other, physics and chemistry. So she was a model for her daughter, who went into chemistry and later on in physics, and, and made a very successful career. And I think Marie Curie played a very important role in that. Another male example are the Braggs, William Henry Bragg and William Lawrence Bragg. Uh, they both together got the Nobel Prize. Fantastic uh, for the of investigation of crystal structure by means of X-ray spectroscopy. So if you want to know the structure of a certain material, you can do this by uh, crystal structure analysis. And the father and the son developed this, uh, this methodology, which is valid today, and they both together got the Nobel Prize. But there are many examples, and this is a majority, where women were excluded from the Nobel Prize. I think th um, the most important is Otto Hahn, Nobel Prize for Physics, so the fission of uranium. Actually, it was Lise Meitner. It was a very simple chemical experiment where they had uranium and they put in neutron and this uh, 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 was split into uh, radium and something else. And it was Lise Meitner who did this experiment. But Otto Hahn was the boss, so he got the Nobel Prize in 1944, the basis of uh, fission and at uh, atomic bomb and, and reactors. Not Lise Meitner, she was not even uh, a mention in that. And, and the second maybe uh, Epoch-making discovery uh, in medicine, Watson, Crick, and Wilkins, they discovered the structure of the DNA, our genetic code. And Rosalind Franklin, who was actually a, a crystallographer, had already predicted it must be a helix. But these three men got the Nobel Prize, Rosalind Franklin, who died later, uh, uh, because I think in connection with that was not mentioned uh, by that. We are on a good way in this way. This is a pair of two ladies, Elizabeth Blackburn and Carrick Reidner. Carrick Reidner is a student of Elizabeth um, uh, Blackburn, and they have, and she did the experiments. She had the ideas, but they were congenial. And they both together got the Nobel Prize. A young person, unthinkable many years ago, and what I want to say is so the thinking of the Nobel Committee has also changed. A young lady and her, her, her mentor, her teacher, what they discovered is that the, at the end of chromosomes, uh, certain uh, DNA parts called the teleomeres because they are at the, at the end, by every round of division of a cell, these are destructed until we are 80, 90, 100. This somehow determines how old we get, and this they have discovered. I'm at the end. This is Alma, my little grand daughter. She lives in Cairo, certainly not in an environment where uh, gender equality uh, is discussed very much. But I have also an engagement in all that to help 
that she will enter in the world when she is, she is now six years old. There's an old photograph. When she gets into her education phase that she does not face anymore, these walls which young women face today, I want her to be free. I want her to be free in a free continent, Europe, a continent which we love, and that she will be able to make her free decision how to live, how to study, and how to go on, and not struggle with things of gender equality, where we think we have come far, but if we look really, we need a long way to go. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best, especially these few men among us. Thank you very much.